Okay, anybody ever make a mistake in here? Have you ever made a mistake that you knew that you made the mistake, but you felt like you might be able to get away with not claiming it? Might be able to lay it off to somebody else? Might be able to let somebody else just pick up the pieces and all that? You ever do that? You ever be tempted to do that? <laughs> Screw it up, but you don't want nobody to know it. Somebody will typically come back in there and say, he left all of these bolts loose. Or the picture I showed you one day that had the radiator hose clamp around the neck on the radiator and the hose was not even, didn't even have the clamp on it, but the, whoever was doing it was doing it in the dark, laying up under there apparently, whatever. Uh, loose bolts. You come along and find all kinds of stuff. Stuff that people broke and they didn't say anything about it. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the door panels that you thought popped off of there with the little Christmas trees, but they actually hooked on there and you break the door panel. And there's just all kinds of little stuff that's going on like that. So what we got to do is you're supposed to take responsibility for your mistake. Now, this lady right here, she said, she, I got an email from this lady. She said, I took my 2006 Honda in for new rear rotors and brake pads at a national chain service center. It drove away just fine. She had no problem, drove away, or things like that's okay. But she said she didn't usually take the car on the freeway because she doesn't need to on her commute last week. On the freeway, the car would not go over 50 miles an hour. When I pulled to the side, she smelled something burning pretty bad. No smoke, just odor. So she took it to the dealer, and there were no error codes. They didn't even drive the car, apparently. They just pulled, went and pulled the codes, see? Uh, the dealer wasn't the one that did the work on it, but anyway. Tuesday, the same thing happened, so she took it back to the dealer. The service manager and her went on a test drive, and on the freeway, it did the same thing. Wouldn't go, he stopped, it was stinking and smelling like burning. So I pulled it to the side, and the burning odor just filled the car up, and he said the smell was the brakes. Went back to the dealership, and they found the brake fluid had been contaminated with what they believed to be engine oil. Right? So that national chain store was the last shop to do any brake work. Turns out the new rear rotors are not new, nor are the pads. The damage they caused with the oil requires the entire brake system to be rebuilt. Now, that sort of, if what she's saying was so, she, they pay, they charged her for putting brake pads and rear rotors on, but they, they didn't even do the work. And furthermore, they did something to cause her brakes to go lousy, where the oil is going to swell all the rubber up, and then the brakes won't release, and it's, it's just really a nasty business, right? So, here we go. Repair is done wrong or not at all, and they have to take a little bit of integrity and stuff going on there. Some of these situations happen because some shops tend to hire people that haven't been properly trained. Now, I have known of shops personally. I mean, I worked at a shop one time years ago, back in the early 80s. It's actually a dealership. Uh, it, was, uh, it was before I went to work at the dealership where I stayed for a long time before I came here. But anyway, this guy right here would uh, go and say, you've got a bad rotor, and they don't have a rotor in stock, but I've got one under my workbench. I'll sell you for $50 or whatever. And so he sold, he always kept a rotor up under his bench. It would fit just about everything, and he made extra money that way, and that wasn't right either. Um, then there were the people I was talking about that whenever this one guy died, and they went and found all these brand new parts under his bench that he had never had it installed, you know. All right, so this service manager, this the GM dealer that I was talking to a while back, and it's been probably several years ago, he says he turns down applications for mechanics fairly regularly because a lot of people have, fooled around and built a 350 Chevrolet engine in their backyard and managed to get it started and they think their dealership material is because they got a, you know, got one engine running or something, or they've tinkered with stuff. But there's no way to tell exactly what happened to that Honda, the, the consequences of the work the outlet did or didn't do. Somebody poured something in there that they shouldn't have, probably. And she fought them for a long time on that. I don't know if they ever, you know, made that good or not. But here's a no-brainer. There's no excuse for letting something like this leave your service back. You pull it in there and say, well, I wasn't working on the battery. You know, or you've got all of this other work you're doing under the hood and you let it go out of here with the battery terminal looking like that. You know what I mean? What's, what's wrong with it? Does it look like a mechanic's been under that hood? If, you, if somebody leaves with battery terminals that are looking that bad? That's nasty. All right. So when you, and you shouldn't have any screws left. Now, all of these screws right here that you see in this picture came out of a single vehicle's dashboard. I remember when I used to work on the uh, these uh, old uh, 90 model Ford probes and stuff, we'd have to pull the instrument cluster out of them to do some work in there. There was 33 screws you had to take out to get the instruments cluster out of a 90 model Ford probe. 
you know, to get there. Are all the ones that are Every one of those out? came out of the same vehicle. Every one of them. They were left out? Or they no. They came out and they were sitting there in there, but the person that did that work, when you've got that many screws in a magnet tray, you need to make darn sure you're paying close attention when you're going back together because every one of those screws needs to go back where they came from. And of course, I know nobody in here has ever had any screws left over, right? No, everybody's shaking their head. Liars. All right. Now then, uh, this guy, my car developed a gas smell after you worked on it. The amount of stuff that in the trunk. Look at this. I run a screw in there with a reckless disregard for the fact that there was a gas tank in there. And they went right through with one of them self drilling screws, whatever was being mounted back there, whew, right into the gas tank, and it was just stinking and it was leaking a little bit of gas and all that kind of thing. So, what do you do about that? I heard one mechanic one time at a, at a dealership, I mean, at a manufacturer school, was everybody was sitting there, you know, every now and then somebody would get one of the mechanics that's at a school will get to the floor, and he says, uh, you know, I, I felt like there was water in the gas. And so he says, I drilled a one-eighth hole in the bottom of the gas tank and let all the gas run out of it. And then I put a pop rivet in the hole. And I was thinking, what? This guy's drilling a hole in the gas tank and putting a pop rivet in there to stop it up? I mean, how much of this can you do before you actually are going to cause something really serious to go wrong? Right. Uh, the technician missed something that should have been obvious, and he sold an O2 sensor the customer didn't need. Do you see it? He sold them an oxygen sensor they didn't need when basically all they needed to do was a really good uh, visual inspection. And you can see it in this picture if you look. And you're talking about you're talking about right here. Yeah. Alright, now why would that make him sell them an oxygen sensor? The sun metered air is going to say that that thing is you can yeah, do you're pulling air through right there. You're pulling air in right there that's not metered. See, that's supposed to be in there. And that was basically something that was missed. It came in with a check engine light. The guy throws a sensor at it. And, you know, here we go. All right. Now, when they, uh, when they, when they pop the hub cap off, we find this after you did the work and put the tires on. I don't know how many times I've seen this. I took this picture right here in the shop to it. Who's done that? Everybody that's ever come in here that I guess had never pulled a tire off before wants to put them back on that way. I don't know why. I don't remember anybody, well I've actually been doing demonstrations where people would come that we were trying to recruit or whatever and I'd say pull the tire off and put it back on and I would see them pull the lug nuts off that were on there the right way and try to put them back on their own. And I don't know what's going on there. I guess I just like that curved outside look to it. But I mean, I don't remember a time in my life when I didn't know what how a lug nut went on. I mean, I honestly don't. You know, when I was a little bitty boy, I would notice when my dad was pulling the tire off that that taper was in and all that. And I used to wonder if five was enough to hold it. You know, I mean, I'd say that they would come off on there. All right, so when they find this after you replace the fuel pump and the vehicle quit again. So you put a fuel pump on it, it seemed like it was okay, and they went down the road, and then they it quit again in the next town, and the people said, look at this. This actually goes through the, the uh, floor pan right in front of the, on that Montana that we saw this on. It basically had a brand new fuel pump somebody had put in it, and these old chalky connectors right here, uh, because of where GM mounted that thing, you know, it basically was up there where there's all kinds of splash going, and that was a mess. Well, it sort of tripped us up, too, because we put our test light on hot, went to the relay output terminal going to the pump. It didn't light up. We kicked the gas tank, and it lit up. Well, when we took the gas tank down, we saw the pump was new. We looked a little farther. We found out we had an open circuit right here. We had jarred that when we kicked the gas tank. And so we basically had to replace that connector, which is really, by the way, hard and expensive if you can't find one in a salvage yard. You ever buy a wire harness from a salvage yard? You know what they do? They cut the dead gum connectors off of it and just throw you some wire. Like we bought from Canada. Yeah, well, it's better. from where? Canada. Oh, Canada. Canada, Canadian salvage yards don't cut connectors off? Oh. Very nice. All right, I'll have to keep that in mind. When somebody finds this and you were the last person to change the wall, some of you guys might Same remember. Cloud. Somebody <laughs> might, might remember whenever. I told Zach to change the oil in that Crown Victoria, and then I looked over there, and he had a cheater pipe 
and he was done with it, and I was like, oh no. And I walked over there, and he's trying to turn it to the right. And he, well, he's still turn, he's turning it. And I said, Zach, which way do you turn something to take it off? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, some people struggle with that. But I mean, whenever they're taking the brake caliper off, they, I'll see people trying to do lefty loosey when the bolt's coming this way. That don't work. And I'm always saying, you got to turn the bolt the way you want it to go. And you don't ever take a left-hand thread bolt and put it in a right-hand thread hole with an impact wrench either. Okay? <laughs> by the way, that bolt cost $27. I got another one. Yeah. yeah. You put it in there and don't come back out either. Yeah. All right. I worked at a dealership for 15 years under a really sharp dealer principal. We got it with dealer principal, the guy that runs the place. And he had a lot of integrity. This guy was really sharp. And he, he, was, he could see through a line of bull crap if a customer or a mechanic or a, Anybody else was feeding him a line, he always knew it. This guy was really sharp. He didn't get to where he was accidentally. Now, he was always in search of the truth. That's what he wanted to know, was he wanted the truth. And he was really fair-minded about it. Do I need to give you these or both mine? I think they're both your corporate friends. Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. Alright, so the service manager at that shop came and went. Some had integrity and some didn't, you know. One day I was called out here to have a look at his 89 Crown Victoria that had been repaired a year earlier by one of our line technicians. We had 25 guys working at the dealership. And this module right here, on that distributor on that thing right there, this guy had gone to a shop and he said that uh, the car had quit running and he went to a shop and they said this module was busted. People like to pry on that with a, with a uh, screwdriver to move the distributor when they're setting the time and then when they do, They'll break that thing, and it may run and it may not when that thing broke. All right, so, and he said that the people that put it on said that whoever worked on it the last had busted that module, so he had to pay $100 for a module, and careless technicians like to pry on it. All right, so the service manager usually tried to tap dance out of situations like that, but the big boss was there, and so he raked the service manager to the side and called me up there, and I went up there as an expert witness and I went and found out in the file, you know, you open the file and you find the serial number of that car and you pull it out and you see the most recent work order and I saw who worked on it and I said, and I went back and I said, yeah, we broke it. He had put a manifold gasket on it and to do that you had to pull this distributor out and to do that you had to set the time in and I knew this yo-yo was somebody, it was probably going to be somebody that broke that. So I just said, we broke it and so the, the uh, slippery tap dance thing, you know. I just said this and this and that. So anyway, the dealer principal refunded the guy's money. He went to the cashier's office and says, give me $100 for this guy to pay for a money. So he wanted to know what the truth was. You know, if you're really interested in the truth and you're going to do what's right when you find out what the truth is, that's what's really important here. All right. So, the diesel radiator fan. Now, Jonathan's been working with these diesels. You know as well as I do that when you switch off one of them diesels, it goes, it stops. I mean, it stops. And it hits a compression stroke. And that fan is big and heavy. And if you don't tighten that fan on there really good, whenever it stops, that fan will come off of there. Or will almost come off of there. And so what happened on this one was it stopped. It almost came off. When you cranked it up, it did finish coming off and it went through the radiator. It just tore the radiator all to pieces. All right, now the guy that uh, he screwed the fan on but forgot to tighten it. I'm always telling you guys, don't stop in the middle of an important tightening operation if it's a spark plug or a drain plug or anything like that. Don't stop and walk away and say, I'll remember to tighten that when I come back from lunch because it's, chances are you're going to forget it. If you make a habit of doing that, you're going to make a lot of mistakes like that. All right, so what did this guy do? He knew what the, the fan was, was coming off and destroy the radiator was his fault. He knew this. As soon as he heard that's what happened, he was like, oh, I forgot to tighten the fan. What did he do? He went to the same file cabinet I went to. He found the file on that pickup, pulled his work order out, and saw where he had written on their repair order he had taken the fan off and reinstalled it. So he tried to mark out on the back of the work order where he had written down that he had took the fan off. I mean, he just scribbled over it with his pen, thinking maybe they won't see that, but everybody knew what happened. Well, he lost a lot of credibility there. He's trying to get out of it. And then you know. a lot of them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's going over there and say, look, I mean, you know, I just forgot it's hiding the fan and it went through the radiator. You know, what can I say? You know, it was, it was a mistake that shouldn't have happened, but it did. 
All right, so anyway, the best thing to do is take responsibility for your screw up and come clean. Now, this is the banker's Lincoln. I was telling somebody about this the other day. This old guy that drove his Lincoln had a gun under every seat. He had a gun in the glove box. He had a, a chrome riot shotgun in the trunk and a crowbar back there. So if somebody knocked that guy over the head and threw him in the trunk, when he woke up, he was going to have a shotgun to, to go after him with when they opened the trunk a second time. So he's that little silver-haired old guy. Had gun there. So I was taking the upper part of the back seat out because he wanted a CD player to put in there, you know, and I had to pull all of that junk out, the run wire and all that kind of stuff, the other one that put in the trunk. And something happened. I don't even remember what happened. Somebody bumped me or something when I was taking the seat out. And when I stumbled against it, I scratched the paint behind the, you know, the driver's side rear door. And the first thing that I did when I saw what I had done is I went to the fixed operations manager and I showed him what happened. I said, look, Ronnie, this is what happened here. I was moving the seat and he just scratched the paint there. So he brought the banker and showed the guy what had happened. He said, I'm not worried about that. I'll just take it like it is. And if it gets to bother me, I'll come back and let you fix it. Wasn't even a big deal, you know what I mean? I mean, it looks up to, you know, to some people it probably would have been World War III, but we had a body shop there. And one time the service manager told me to drive this Ford Escort home that was sometimes what was starting. And of course, if you're used to going your own way on your regular routine, at the time I was driving a little diesel rabbit because it got like 55 miles to the gallon and it was cheap to drive back and forth to Dover. And I drove that car home I wasn't used to, and when I pulled up to my mailbox, I was too close to the mailbox, and I hit the mailbox with the mirror, and it just scratched the crud out of it. So I took it back, and he says, did the car mess up? I said, no, but I sure messed up that mirror when I pulled up there on my... <laughs> so anyway, he, we took it around to the body shop, and the body shop fixed it, and you couldn't even tell it was ever messed up. So they, were, they were good at that. I mean, it made more sense to fess up than it would have to try to cover up the mistake. Now, this story deals with the Toyota Camry, and one of my students had done some cylinder head work on about a year previously, a year ago when this was written. The cylinder head was removed, the valve job was done, the car mounted the soil machine for a long time. No problems. And then all of a sudden it got a really aggressive oil leak. And we found out it was coming from the passenger rear corner of the cylinder head gasket. <coughs> so Bert removed the valve cover, the time and chain tensioner, and both the camshafts. We checked the cylinder head bolt on that left rear corner, thinking maybe somehow he might have missed it when he was torquing them. That one right there. Found it wouldn't tighten. All it would do was turn around and around. Now these are torque to yield bolts, and he was a good mechanic. I mean, he was not, he was a big strong guy. But I was thinking, so what happened here? You know, how did the world this happen? Those torque to yield bolts, you're just it'd be really you'd have to really work at it to break one of those off. You know what I'm saying? And that aluminum is really strong stuff. Well, the bolts had been replaced the previous year when we done the head work because they're torqued to yield bolts. The oil leak was a result of that failure. And the VVT solenoids right there in that same place, there's oil pressure going to it. The only thread that could have failed were the aluminum threads in the block. So what we did was we pulled the head. It's a 17-hour labor charge to pull the head off a 2002 or 3 Toyota Camry. And the job's not that hard. There's quite a few steps and tricks and a lot of bolts and so on. It's not a free spinning engine, so you can bend valves if you're not careful. Look at that. 17.2 hours for the 2002 Toyota Camry sedan. All right. An hour later, Bert had the head off. Look at that. Those threads came right out of that block. Right? Now, what do you suppose caused that? What was the reason why the threads came out of the block? Why would that happen? I mean, he was not... He didn't, did he do something wrong? Did somebody oh. deck the head? No. Cross-threaded? Huh? Didn't cross-thread it. Uh, sometimes I've seen it. Is that a helical? No, uh, that's the threads that came out of the head. I've still got that little springy looking threads that uh -huh. came out of the head in my box in there. I've seen people have the heads decked and you tie them down and the bolts come like they bottom out in the hole before they get tied. Yeah. Well, you're close, but what happened on that one, the only thing that could have happened, in that oil in that hole. And it's the smartest thing you can do is get you a blower that's got a long, skinny snout on it, even if you have to build one. When you're putting one back together and putting the heads on it, if you've had it apart, and when you pull the heads off, liquid runs everywhere, and you're not going to have antifreeze on the wall or anything else. Now, down there at the bottom of the hill, Eddie had a couple of his students working on a big old VT904 Cummins engine it was a really nice trainer engine he had and they had all on the bottom of a hole and they couldn't get the bolt to go down so they just kept getting bigger and bigger uh, cheater pipes 
until they busted the block on that motor, trying to tighten it big old head bolts with a bigger and bigger cheater pipe. And just destroyed a really expensive, hard to replace trigger engine. But, what you, but you, you know, somebody that's been doing it, first time I ever ran into this was on a, a 440 Chrysler I built in a black you know, New Yorker I was you know, rebuilding. That's another story. But whenever I put it back together, there was oil in one of the bottom when they hold that one, but 18. What am I supposed to think? You know what I'm saying? So I buckled them things down and called myself torquing them and all. Well, it didn't bite down on the cylinder head and it blew the gasket. You know, and I had to pull the head off the next day and clean this stuff out of the hole. And, you know, the guy that I was working with, he went on. But the uh, diesels that GM made out of a 350 back in the early 80s, they would do that. And what they would have to do on those, the mechanics had to pull all of the head bolts out because they were bottoming out, like you were talking about, and put real thick washers on them because they were blowing head gasket. Anyway, that's what that looks like up close. Those threads, those were the threads that came out of it. That gun thing and the oil in there underneath it. Must have been some liquid in that hole when we torqued the head bolt. It's the only thing that would make that happen. Because it torques down and gets that liquid. It's going to begin to shear those threads. But it lasted almost a year before that happened. Now there was one guy when I published this in the magazine, he kept sending me emails saying, you're going to keep fixing everything that breaks along with that, breaks down on that car forever more. So well, no, I know we did this. You know what I mean? All right, so the clamping force was applied to the gasket, the hydraulic lock of the fluid against the tip of the bolt started to exert a lot of tons of pressure on those threads until it finally sheared them off. Then the bolt wound up loose and the oil leak happened because it was right there in that spot. Simple oversight. So this was the only head bolt on that engine where the failure occurred. None of the other head bolts were just liquid in one hole. See that? And so the engine would have welded its rotating components together if it had happened on a long trip. People can be driving along on a long trip, and if it springs an oil leak like that, it'll leak all of the oil out just to fry the motor. You know, there's somebody in a big situation like that. Most shops have got insurance against this kind of thing, you know? All right, so what do you do now? There are some special helicoil sets just for head bolts. Now, this helicoil kit right here costs about $150. And there are longer helicoils than a regular helicoil that are made just for head bolts. Okay, so you got the, this is how you do that. Your normal hole looks like that. Your stripped hole looks like that. And so basically you're going to take your, uh, enlarge the hole, put the helicoil down in there, then you use your helicoil tool to run it down in there. You guys have got a worksheet on fixing those threads. You were talking about, you said you keep calling them treads, and they're not treads, they're threads. <laughs> treads look on a tire, okay? Okay, now that head bolt travels several inches through the aluminum block before the bolt reaches any threads. The torque to yield faster, it needs some strength to do their stretching. That element had to be preserved. So consider the fact 11 millimeter head bolt was passing through a 12 millimeter hole all the way to those threads, and that helix bolt was bigger than the upper part of the hole. So the hole had to be enlarged, but how much do we, can we enlarge the hole to be safe? I did some measuring there. We used a 5 8 drill bit. And how tough would it be to come up with a drill bit exactly the right size to accommodate the helix bolt without weakening the engine block? So we ordered the helix bolt and used a 5 8 inch drill bit to bring the upper part of the hole out to work the size. That was a job. That big old DeWalt drill out there. Uh, I, I got that thing pretty much drilled down in there and it broke the drill bit. But we managed to get the drill bit out. If you break the drill bit off in a hole, it ain't that big of a deal to get it out of there. If you break a tap off in a hole, that's a different story. And in this particular case, we, we got the drill bit out of there and we cleaned it up with another drill bit. And we, uh, but the first helix wall didn't hold. And we had to pull all that mess back apart and put another helix wall and go in there deeper and make it stronger. And so we managed to get that thing straightened out. But the long and the short of it is, we have got to be aware of the fact that, you know, these people are trusting us to do the work on their cars, and we need to do as good a job as we know how to do. And when we mess up, everybody messes up sooner or later. Did that go on? I guess it did. Grease causes that? Huh? Grease causes that? Grease can cause it if there's a lot, if there's enough of it. Um, if you put too much motor oil on a bolt, it'll cause it. You can put too much on there so it runs down in there. Uh, but I will tell you this, some, some kind of, some grease or motor oil uh, is going to increase the clamping force tremendously whenever you're putting a little bit of grease on that. And I was in a little um, seminar thing over there when I went to KC Vision last time, and this guy had this deal that would measure the clamping force of these bolts. And so he would torque the bolt to 35 foot-pounds with a torque wrench while this little hydraulic chamber that he was squeezing was measuring the amount of Tor of, of clamping pressure, and so with a 35 psi on that, he had like uh, 30,000 pounds of clamping force. 
that he was measuring. So he screwed that out of there and got a brand new bolt and a brand new washer and he put a little bit of motor oil on it. Just a little motor oil, not a lot, just a little bit. And he put it back together and torqued it to 35 foot pounds and he got 45,000 pounds of clamping force. He got another 15,000 pounds of clamping force by just putting a little bit of motor oil on the threads. Made that much of a difference. And so I kind of like when we put uh, the uh, lug nuts back on, I like to put a little bit of grease on the threads because you're going to get better clamping force even with the same torque. You're going to get better clamping force and you know your lug nuts are going to do better with a little bit, a little bit of grease on the thread. You don't want to put it enough in there to where it's going to hydraulic, you know what I'm saying? But a little dab of grease won't hurt anything. Okay, so does anybody have a story to tell? Yeah, grease is not bad. I mean, if you didn't put so much on there, you know, you'll be all right. Uh, but you'll find out if you put too much. No. They'll be all right. You know, probably, hopefully. You know. <laughs> they'll probably, if you're if you're between Orlando and Miami on the way to Key West, if it failed, that's when it'll happen. Oh. You know the ARP head studs. Have you ever seen them? What is it? ARP head studs. ARP? What does that mean? They're studs and you take bolts, the head bolts out and you put studs. Oh, put studs in there? Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Okay. Anyway, they send a special type lubricant to put on their threads and it's got directions how much you put on there and all that. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty. I mean, if you, think, if you compare this to what you already know, a lot of times you can start making associations and say, you know, this is something we need to kind of pay attention to. Anyway, so.